Thank you. Thank you. The clicker. Thank Isn't you. it beautiful? Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Thank you very much. So um, let's start off with a little uh, lesson in language. All right? I've been taught a few words while I've been here, so it's now your turn. Uh, I will give you the Australian welcome, and you will give it back to me, okay? G'day. G'day. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, what a delightful day it's been. So much learning, so much sharing. So I'd like to take you on a little journey that's been very exciting for us. And if we go back to uh, 1999, we were about the quarter of the size we are now as a company. We uh, basically had all of our business in the United States. And we had a dream. We had a dream of taking the blue and yellow can with a little red top to the world. And in thinking about that dream, we had a realization. The first realization was that micromanagement was not scalable. How were we going to take this to the world if we only knew how to manage at a short distance? And I happened to be flying to China, and at that time I was reading a book by the Dalai Lama. And I read this statement and it said, our purpose in life is to make people happy. If you can't make them happy, at least don't hurt them. <laughs> and I thought about business, and I thought what most businesses do is hurt people. I talk a lot about a dear friend of mine. His name is the soul-sucking CEO. <laughs> because most leaders and most CEOs suck the souls out of the companies. So we decided that we would go on the journey about putting pleasure in the job that puts perfection in the work. Now, we've all been talking today about if you put pleasure in the job, you would put perfection in the work. And we all believe this, don't we? Yes. Well, we should believe it because Aristotle said that in 384 BC. So we are very slow learners. <laughs> so much slow learners that we know, and Gallup has been uh, quoted a bit today, that employee engagement sucks. Two thirds of people who go to work today are either disengaged or actively disengaged, which means they're either working or against or not even in line with the purpose, vision, and values of an organization if the organization is smart enough to even have a purpose, and many of them don't. So we went on a journey, and we, we said to ourselves, what do we need to think about in an organization? And we said, well, there are four things that are important in an organization. People, purpose, passion, and products. But the first one is people. So this is the model that we've now used for 20 years in thinking about how we should think about our business. And you'll see the first thing we think about is people. And we call ourselves a tribe, not a team. And I'll share a little bit later why we call a tribe and what's the power of the tribe. The next one is purpose or why. Why do we exist? We envisage a place where people go to work every day, they make a contribution to something bigger than themselves, they learn something, they feel safe and they go home happy. That's the perfect workspace we envisage. And our purpose will take us there. The next one is values. Values in an organization are there to set us free, not to in any way restrict us for what we'll do. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, let me talk about where most companies hang out. I call it the typhoon zone. This is where companies just think about strategy and just think about tactics because they are thinking about being servants to the short-term thinking of most people on Wall Street. Now, you must know we are a public company. We have been a public company since 1962, so you, 72. So you would expect I'd be standing here telling you that the most important person in my life are the investors on Wall Street. Eh. The most important people in our life is our people because if we take care of our people, our people will take care of our customers and our customers will take care of our shareholders. But if you stay in that typhoon zone, you'll eventually destroy the company 
Because without a, the people, without a clear purpose, without values to protect you, you are on a short journey. That journey will be over. And there are many wrecks of companies on the sidelines that you'll see that stayed in that typhoon zone. The last thing we talked about was learning. We need to be a learning organization. So we decided we would remove the word failure from our vocabulary. We don't make mistakes at WD40 Company. We have a learning moment. <laughs> and what is a learning moment? A learning moment is a positive or negative outcome from any situation that needs to be openly and freely shared to benefit all. So I love the work that Simon Sinek's been doing. Simon and I met each other about five or six years ago on a panel in Phoenix. We became really good friends. And what I love about Simon, not only is he passionate about the subject of empowering people and, and building great workplaces, but he made things really simple. Instead of talking about vision and mission and words that sometimes have people in organization go, what do you mean? Why don't we just make it really simple? Why don't we talk about why we exist and how we do it and what we do? To me, it sounds simple. So let's think about WD-40. This is why we exist. Does anybody want to think and, and share what they think might be our purpose? Why do we wake up every day? I can't hear you. Huh? Grease the world. Anybody else? Come on, I need at least three answers. Have fun. Have fun. Oh, we're getting close. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to make you do something if you don't get involved in this. It might not be pretty. <laughs> okay. So if I was to walk up to you and you would say to me, hi, who are you? And I'd say, hi, I'm Gary. And I'd say to you, what do, I, what do you do? I say, I sell oil in a can. You go, mm, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm really purposely, oh, that's a purpose. I'm engaged about that one. Yes. <laughs> Wrong. We're in the memories business. Why do we exist? We exist to create positive, lasting memories in everything we do. We solve problems, we create, make things work smoothly, and we create opportunities. So we wake up every day to create positive, lasting memories, which is much more exciting than stopping a squeak, right? So if you talk to anyone at our company, they'll say, I'm in the memories business. Now, why are memories so important? Because at the end of the day, that's all you'll ever have. I don't care how you do your work, where you are, how big your house or your car is. At the end of the day, it all goes back in the box and the box is going to be about the same size. And all that would be left from you are the memories that you decided to create or help create. So our job every day with all of our, we do is to create positive lasting memories. How do we do that? We create them by cultivating a tribal culture of learning and teaching that produces a highly engaged workforce that lives our company values every day. What do we do? Well, you know what we do. We make the blue and yellow can with a little red top and a bunch of other products that we sell in 176 countries around the world, which is really exciting because everybody has the opportunity to touch what we do. But how do we set people free? We set them free by having a set of values that are there to allow them to do whatever they want without quack, quack, quacking up the hierarchy. You've all seen companies that have to quack up the hierarchy where they can't make decisions, right? You've seen those people at counters in hotels and airlines. Could you please do this for me? All right, that's not our policy, quack, quack, quack. I'm not allowed to do that, quack, quack, quack. I've got to go ask my boss, quack, 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 <laughs> because they have no freedom. But values are there to create freedom. And values need to be hierarchical. The first value in the organization needs to be the most powerful value and needs to engage people and empower them the most. So what are our values? Well, our first value is we value doing the right thing. Each one of these values has a paragraph written underneath it that actually describes what doing the right thing means. So every time in our organization, our people can ask the question of anybody, is this the right thing to do, based on our definition? The second value is, funnily enough, we value creating positive, lasting memories in all of our relationships. Now, 
That doesn't mean we don't have crucial conversations. Of course we do. We're adults, we all do that. We challenge each other, but we do it with respect and dignity. Because if you work at our company, we will care about you. We'll be candid with you. And what does candid mean? Simply, no lying, no faking, no hiding. We'll hold you accountable, but we want to be held accountable too because accountability goes both ways. We all get in trouble in relationships and situations because we do not understand what we're holding each other accountable for. I have a beautiful wife and I get in trouble all the time because she says, no, you didn't say you were going to do that. I say, yeah, honey, I did. No, no, no. So there was a misunderstanding. So accountability wasn't clear. And we expect our people to be responsible. Our third value is we value making it better than it is today, which is about innovation and development. Our fourth one is we value, we value succeeding as a tribe while excelling as individuals. The tribe comes first. We are there to support each other. We value owning it and passionately acting on it. And we value sustaining the WD-40 economy. Now, you would think that that should be our first value because we're a public company, right? We live and die by our shareholders' positive, lasting memory or not about us. And it doesn't also just say we value profitability. It says we value building the economy. What does that mean? It means if we are a strong, profitable company, in good times, we are very successful. And in times that are not so good, when the seas are a little rough, we have a strong ship and master mariners in our tribe to help us go across those oceans. So we've got to build the structure within the company. And why do I say values are like freedom? Well, if you think of values something like a field with a a herd of cattle, and around that field, there are hundreds of hungry wolves waiting to eat the cattle. If we put the feed for the cattle in the middle of the pasture, the chances are the majority of those cattle will always stay around the middle or the center of our values. It doesn't mean they're not going to wander off to farther parts of that paddock, but what it does say is that the chances of them going under the fence and actually getting eaten by the wolves are a lot less. So values are there to set people free because we want our cattle to run around in that paddock and have so much fun. There is many, many stories of companies that you've all read where the people have wandered off underneath that fence out to the wolves, been eaten and had many of their other colleagues eaten as well because they violated values or just didn't do the right thing. And as I said, we love learning moments. Learning moments are so empowering. If you walk around our offices anywhere in the world, you'll hear people talk, this is the learning moment I had. So what is the learning moment doing? It's enriching our learning and making sure that we're there and we're sharing what works, but we're also sharing what isn't working so we can support our tribe members. We also have something else in the company that I think you'll like. We heard about this this morning, which was accountability to each other. And we call it the maniac pledge. And the Maniac Pledge is an empowering statement that we have everybody understand. And here's what it says. I am responsible for taking actions, asking questions, getting answers and making decisions. I will not wait for someone to tell me. If I need to know, I am responsible for asking. I have no right to be offended that I didn't get this sooner. And if I am doing something others should know about, I am responsible for telling them. What is that meant to do in the organisation? Take this out. You know, the finger pointing, not my fault, I wasn't told, why didn't you tell me, I should know. We are responsible to each other for making people aware and making it so that they understand what they should understand. Everybody in the company takes this pledge. I want to talk about tribes. You're all probably aware of Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy to self actualization The first two rungs on that, most organisations deliver. It's survival and security, and most organisations pay people to go to work so they can buy food and have somewhere for their families to sleep, and it's somewhat secure. Here's where the magic is. Most organisations do not 
exercise belonging. Every one of you in this audience today has either left a relationship, an organisation or a party because you didn't feel like you belong. Every one of you. Why do most people leave companies? Because they don't feel like they belong. They hate their boss. My friend Ken Blanchard often says, it's a shame that people in an organization only know they're doing a good job because someone didn't yell at them today. <laughs> so, we adopted in our, in our company the principles of a tribe. And a tribe to us is, has, has behaviors that not only do they enrich the culture of the organization, but they challenge us as leaders. I, I absolutely love this fable. It says, a lion used to prowl about a field in which four oxen used to dwell. Many a time he tried to attack them, but wherever he came close, they turned their tails to another, and whichever way they came to attack, they protected each other. One day at last, they, however, they fell apart quarrelling and went to the corner of the, the paddock on their own and the lion came in and took them one by one. As a tribe, we're united to protect each other. So we did some work and studied some attributes of tribes. And being an Australian, I said, let's study what are the attributes of tribal leadership for the Australian Aborigines. So please, come with me now. Let's all fly down to Australia. Let's go into the middle of Australia to Ayers Rock, that big old weapon rock right in the middle of the country. It's now called Uluru. Let's turn back the time clock thousands of years and let's go to a tribal meeting. And as we enter that tribal meeting, we'll find the tribe sitting around. And there will be the tribal leader. And the first responsibility of the tribal leader is to be a learner and a teacher. Why is that so? Hands up anyone in the room who's ever, who knows what a boomerang is. Leave your hand up if you've ever thrown a boomerang. Leave your hand up if you were successful at throwing the boomerang. <laughs> ah. No, but did it come back? No. Your tribal leaders many years ago were not doing good for you. Because the number one responsibility of a tribal leader for the Aborigines is to teach the tribe members how to throw a boomerang. Because if you can't throw a boomerang, back then you would not live because it was the tool of survival. So our job, number one job as leaders in a tribal environment is to be learners and teachers. We're boomerang teachers. That's what we must do. The second one is values. Every group of successful tribes over time have had values. You may not agree with the values, they may not be yours, but if you were part of that tribe, you expected to live those values. Not visit them, but live. My favourite movie is Godfather 1. Did the mafia have values? Did you know the consequences of not living those values? You may not agree with them, but everyone has values. The third one, of course, is belonging. And what is belonging? It's recognition, it's understanding, it's, it's feedback, it's tribalism in its sense. It's wearing the pin that identifies how long you've been in the tribe. And back then it might have been an earring or a stub in the nose. It may be the special shirt that you wear in the organisation, so there's belonging. There's future focus. As leaders, if we're going to build an enduring company over time, we have to be looking out on the horizon back there and looking for threats that may be coming to destroy our tribe. As we heard earlier in retail today, they're looking out over the horizon at the threat of e-commerce. If, if the leadership was not looking out and recognising that threat, it would come and destroy them. So as part of our job as leaders is creating this culture is to be future focused. We need to have specialised skills within the organisation. In that tribe in Australia, there were better spear makers and there were very good hut makers, and there were some people who cooked kangaroos better than other people. So we have to recognise it's our job to have these specialised skills. We're warriors. Of course we are, to protect our tribe and to win at our game. And finally, there is celebration. Now, I don't know how many times you've been with Australians, but I tell you what, we know how to celebrate. And in WD-40 Company, we know how to celebrate. 
And you know what? We celebrate good times and we even celebrate, celebrate times not so good because we've all been together. I've learned over the last number of years that there are some attributes to leadership that are very aligned with soul-sucking CEOs. So let me share what these attributes are. Firstly, a soul-sucking CEO does not involve their people. Why should they? Took me hard work to be CEO. I'm the smartest guy in the room. Why should I listen to you? I'm not going to involve you. So why should you feel wanted in this organisation? Leaders are always in servant leadership mode. Soul-sucking leaders don't think that way. I'm the leader, you're here to serve me. In fact, I will have the biggest office in the building. In fact, I will have a reserved parking space in the front. In fact, I will have any special privileges that there should be because I'm not serving you, I'm the soul-sucking CEO. You're here to serve me. That doesn't happen in any of your companies, I'm sure. Every office is the same size, right? Yeah, and there are no, no privileged parking spaces, right? No. Leaders are expected to be competent. Wait a minute, why should I have to be a learner as a CEO? I already got here, I know it all. I'm the competent one. I'm already competent. So why should I even do any more to make myself even more competent? Uh, leaders, leaders are connected with a high emotional intelligence. This is where I think some of the major issues are in happiness at work, and it's called ego. And when ego eats empathy, instead of empathy eating ego, you have the soul-sucking CEO. You definitely have the soul-sucking CEO. So as a CEO, we have to have empathy. We have to be able to connect with our people sincerely. We have to be with them in good times and in bad times. We have to be there for them because it's not about us. As a leader, it's not about me, me, me. It's about the people that we lead because leadership is not about being in charge. Leadership is about taking care of those in your charge. That's truly what leadership is. That's truly what leadership is. Simon Sinek reminds us of that all the time. Leaders need to exercise good judgment. Good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from poor judgment. So it's okay to show your vulnerability. We're just simple human beings. So leaders need to show their vulnerability by saying, yes, I am showing good judgment, but it's because I am vulnerable, I'm not perfect, I'm just a basic human being bumbling down this road of life, bumping into stuff. It's important. And then the slide went off. <laughs> oh, I got it. Learning moment. <laughs> Use the green one. Vulnerability, I'm stupid. <laughs> Leaders have to have a strong sense of self-worth. What do I mean by that? There are times in our organizations when the, the view of hope is not as bright as it could be. And as leaders, we need to make sure that we are being the per people of hope. Now that is not you know, just apple pie and mum hope, but hope surrounded by our ability to be able to see a brighter future than we have today and to be able to share that with the people that follow us in our tribe. So it's very important. Leaders value the gift of contrarians. I love to tell this story because I'm going to tell you about someone that's very dear in my life, and that was my mum. My mum lived to 99 years and nine months old. She passed away about four years ago. And my mum was a wonderful contrarian. What do I mean by a contrarian? It means she used to dish out what we call unconditional love. <laughs> and unconditional love is when someone tells you something that's really, really true and are brave enough to tell it to you because they love you so much. And I used to remember 
my mum, I used to fly down, I'd, I'd moved from Australia and I'd, I'd used to fly down to Australia uh, every year for her birthday and up until 97 she lived in the family home and that was for 72 years in the same family home. So just before we moved her into some assisted living because as she used to say, Gary, my body's ended but my brain's still good. I'd go down and anyhow, one day I flew down to Sydney and uh, always I would call her before I left Los Angeles um, just to remind her that I was arriving the next morning because at 97, she used to forget a couple of little things. She had a great memory for stuff I did wrong, but a couple of little things. <laughs> and I'd call her from Los Angeles airport and I'd say, hey, Mum, I'm on my way. Oh, yes, Gary, when will you be here, dear? So I'll be there tomorrow morning. Okay. So I'd fly down to Sydney and I'd get in the car and I'd go out to our family home and it was always around 7.30 in the morning because the plane lands early. I'd go to put my key in the front door. Exactly the same thing happened as it used to when I was 18 years old, coming home at two o'clock in the morning drunk. <laughs> the door would open. Where the hell have you been? You're late. Come inside. There's only two words you need to know when your mum's 97. You want to know what they are? Yes, mum. That's all you need to know. <laughs> so we used to walk out to the kitchen. We'd go out to the kitchen and mum would always have a pink dressing gown on with a, a, a faded nighty underneath. She had curly white hair. She'd wear glasses. And in the morning, she'd always wear a little beanie because it was sometimes cold in July in Australia. And we'd walk out and she'd say, sit down, Gary. Yes, mum. Would you like a cup of tea, dear? No, Mum. Bang! You got a cup of tea whether you wanted it or not. <laughs> I made you some breakfast. Mum, I ate on the plane. Bang! You got breakfast whether you want. You all know this, right? You got mums. <laughs> then she would walk around the other side of the table. Now, the table had a tablecloth on it. The top of the tablecloth was white. The sides still had the floral pattern on it because it had faded so much. And then I would hear a noise, and the noise was like... <laughs> And it was the chair on the other side and mum would sit down. And she'd sit down and she'd look at me. And she'd take a breath and she'd say, Now, Gary, there's a few things that we have to talk about. <laughs> that meant you're about to get a very big dose of unconditional love. <laughs> like, why didn't you send your brother a birthday card? You, haven't been, you didn't call your sister enough last month. All of it's true. We need these sort of people in our business that give us this unconditional love. And although they're not 97, all we need to say is thank you. Thank you. That's all you need to say. Because you know what sucks? 90% of what they tell you is true. <laughs> all we've got to do is listen and we'll get better. When mum passed away, I only took one thing from the family house, the saucer and the cup. And it sits on my bookshelf in my kitchen home in San Diego. And it reminds me every morning when I walk out and I say, yes, mum, find yourself one of these people and go and have tea with your mum. <laughs> Values, le leaders move forward, of course we do. We're there to move the organisation forward. We're there to make sure that we have an organisation that's moving to the future. And... Um, Leaders do what they say they're going to do. One of the biggest ways you let people down is not doing what you say you're going to do as a leader. Leadership is like being on Broadway 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year with the headlights on because there is no room to let people down. If you cannot be a good leader, do not hurt people by trying to. Because the Dalai Lama said our purpose in life is to make people happy. If we can't make them happy, at least don't hurt them. So if you're a shitty leader, don't do it. Because all you're going to do is hurt them. And you have no right to mess with people's lives. They do enough to mess with their own life. Who gives you the right to mess with it? Create an environment where they can flourish. And lastly, of course, leaders are champions of hope. There is always, you know, life is a gift. Let's not send it back unwrapped. And we have only time, talent, treasure and technology to deal with and none of them are abundant. So it's our job as leaders to help people focus on the things that really matter and to take that hope to a result. Leadership really is a balance. It's a, oops, go back. Leadership really is a balance. It's a balance between being tough-minded and tender-hearted. 
and the genius is in the middle, in the end. Organisations that are too tender-hearted, people feel vulnerable and at risk. Organisations that are too tough-minded, people feel vulnerable and at risk. So we have to love them up at work, but hold them accountable at the same time, because people want to feel like they are actually achieving, but achieving greatness in a community where they're recognised. Okay, Gary, all of this stuff you've told us, does it really work? Can anything happen? Can a public company over 18 years actually grow? Yeah, we quadrupled our sales over that time. And as far as the shareholders are concerned, our market cap went from just over $250 million to $1.8 billion. Compounded annual growth rate of total shareholder return of 13% a year. Better than most companies perform on Wall Street. But we only sell oil in a can, right? No, we don't. We sell memories. We're in the memories business. And we create a culture of care, candor, accountability, responsibility. So what do our tribe members say about this? Do they like it, do you think? Well, we've been doing employee opinion surveys for 18 years. At the start of this, we had an employee engagement number that was in the suck zone, the same suck zone that most companies are in now. And we said, if we're going to try things and not everything worked along the way, we need to be able to measure it. So we started. Hot off the press. We just had our last employee opinion survey in March this year. So let me share with you some of the top results. Up one and one percent, because the last one was 98 percent. Our global employees said, 99 percent of them said, I love to tell people I work for WD-40 company. 99 percent. We get a 96 percent participation rate in the employee opinion survey. 99 percent. Employee engagement now is at 93 percent. Actually, 93.3%. Our stated goal in our annual report is to take it to 95%. I feel, I know what results are expected of me, 97%. I feel my opinions and values are a good fit with a WD-40 company, 98%. Do you think that we're living our values and people are, are feeling happy that we are? I think so. I re why do people leave companies? I don't know, but 96% of our in global employees said they respect their coach. I am clear on the company's goals, 97%. So, what did we tell our shareholders? This is what I wrote to our shareholders in our, sh in our shareholder letter just last uh, December. I said, our job is to make sure we create an environment where our tribe members wake up each day, inspired to go to work, feel safe while they are there, and return home at the end of the day fulfilled by the work they do, feeling they have learned something new and contributed to something bigger than themselves. This is the world we envision. If we create this world for our people, they will take care of our customers and that will in turn take care of our stockholders. That was my letter to our shareholders. So I think having been down this journey with my wonderful, wonderful tribe who are responsible for all this, not me, they are we gave them permission to play. I think I can absolutely back up this statement. Purpose-driven, passionate people guided by their values create amazing outcomes. We have a model that proves it. You can take a company, quadruple its sales, and increase its value ninefold by doing one thing, taking care of the people, which means having a clear purpose, a good set of values, and creating an environment. I met someone a little while ago, her name was Frances Hesselbein, I don't know if any of you know her. She's 102 years old, she lives in the United States, she used to be the global CEO of the Girl Guides. She came to a meeting that I was at and she spent four hours talking to us. At the end of the meeting she said, I want to tell you, I have four tattoos. I thought, four tattoos? You're 102 years old, where are they? <laughs> and when did you get them? Because if you got them a long time ago, I won't be able to see them, they'll be faded. She said, let me tell you what they are. And I learned these lessons from um, some great people like Peter Drucker. She said, the first one is, is, is across my chest and it says, have respect for all people. My grandmother taught me that. What do great leaders do? 
They have respect for all people. The second one is behind my ear. I learned that from Peter Drucker. Think first, speak last. How many soul-sucking CEOs don't think first? They speak first, think last. The other one on the other side of the year, ask, don't tell. Soul-sucking CEOs tell, don't ask. And the last one is be an opener of doors. Be a, be a motivator and a propeller of people into the future. So when you find people who not only tolerate your quirks, but celebrate them with glad cries of me too, be sure to cherish them because these weirdos are your tribe. And I guarantee you that your tribe your vibe will attract your tribe. And a beautiful quote from one of the great leaders, it always seems impossible until it's done. You can change the world. Go, create, go convince your leaders to do this. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you. God damn, Gary, you're the man. <laughs> we could listen to you for hours. Isn't that true? Yeah. Um, I have three questions for you. And I thought about them. So, um, <laughs> the first one. Uh, your way of being a leader isn't exactly the way of being a leader that is taught in business schools, is it? So, how did you become, how did you teach yourself to be the leader you are? Um, two, I had two realizations. First one is, is I learned the three most powerful words in life. I don't know. Yeah. And the second one, after learning that, I realized I was consciously incompetent. So, if I was to do anything in life, I needed a lot of other people. And the only way I could do that is to help create an environment where they were treasured and they went to work every day and they made a contribution to something bigger than themselves and they felt safe and went home happy. So um, if we were going to take the blue and yellow can to the world and create these memories, it wasn't about me, it was about how do we do that with others. Mm -hmm. And those three words I don't know are the three most powerful words I've ever learned in my life. Mm -hmm. Listen and be humble. Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the second question is, does being Australian help? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But that was too easy. Three most powerful words, right? I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's move to the third one. Um, I quote you now. You said, uh, as leaders, we have to be there for them in good times and bad times. So let's talk about bad times. How do you keep up happiness at bad times? Um, by being completely transparent. Um, let's go back to 2008. There was a crisis. Well, we decided we weren't going to waste a good crisis, right? <laughs> And we didn't know what the future was going to hold. But we did know that this would pass. This too will end at some time. So we got our tribe together around the world and we said, let's make a pledge. And the pledge we made was, when all this is over, we're still all going to be together with at least one more tribe member. So our goal was to be able to employ one more tribe member, not to lay off anybody. And we went out and then we said, let's work out how we're going to do this. Because I can't do it. So we went out to the tribe and we did some fun things. We had a, a, what we call a stupid policies program. We asked everybody in the company to tell us what our stupid policies were that were costing us money. Guess what? There were some. So we got rid of them. We went out and we asked people to think about the way they did business and how they did it. We never laid off one person. We didn't take away one benefit. We didn't reduce anything other than we had a salary freeze for one year. And the only reason we did it is because we didn't know what the future looked like. So we thought we better do something. But what we did is we came together. So in good times and in not so good times, it's the power of the tribe that carries the tribe through. But it has to be together. Not one of us is as good as all of us. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Rich. <laughs>